the second video about World War I. And we are still in the first lesson about the origins and main stages of the war. So, uh, in the previous video, we saw uh, how in 1914, from the summer to the winter, there was a traditional war of movement happening in uh, Europe on two fronts, in the east of Germany and uh, in the east of France, and that this brief war of movement uh, ended in a stalemate, uh, which was about to last for a very long period. In fact, what was over in 19, uh, at the beginning of 1915 was a long part of the military history of Europe, which had been based on not only a war of movement, that is to say based on the quick movements of troops, but also on the principle of decisive battles. And in fact, in uh, this second part, um, I will examine the fact that it's the, the art of war that changed. But I don't like the expression art of war because uh, I think it's, a, it's inappropriate. So uh, a better expression would be uh, that 1915 marked the beginning of modern warfare. And uh, not only did it uh, change warfare forever, but it also uh, led way to the first global conflict ever. Uh, because uh, due to the stalemate in Europe, uh, there was logically a globalization of the war. The first point, which is perhaps the most famous dimension of World War I, is the emergence of a new form of war uh, that was uh, immediately called trench warfare. So what happened is that at the end of 1914, uh, two camps were fetching each other in the uh, west of Europe. The Allies on one side, French and British against the Germans and uh, soldiers were um, immediately under the threat of uh, new weapons that made uh, uh, any attempt to uh, break through the opposite line uh, something uh, almost impossible and so soldiers has had no other option than to find a place to hide. And uh, the geography of northwestern Europe, which is very flat, uh, compelled them to dig holes in the ground uh, as a first attempt to protect themselves. And so that was the beginning of the trenches. And progressively, trenches that were supposed to be uh, very provisional uh, became uh, long-lasting and so really uh, began to be the, the living places uh, of the soldiers during uh, the First World War. Those images of trenches here on the French side, uh, the first picture was German soldiers, but here you can see French soldiers have really entered uh, our minds in the Western world. They are so iconic of what World War I happened to be. And in fact, what, wo what World War I happened to be, or to become, was what we call a war of attrition. A war of attrition is a war where, in the end, what makes the difference is the ability of one side to sustain its war effort more than his enemy. Uh, because most of the tactics aimed to, um, to exhaust, to tire the other side, not only regarding their motivation, but also their economic ability to sustain the war effort. In French, we would translate attrition warfare by la guerre d'usure. Uh, 
But World War I was not only an economic war, it was a real bloodbath. It was total butchery. And uh, this butchery, this uh, gigantic massacre of human beings, was uh, due to the um, will of the generals to break through, to break through the opposite line and to, uh, to have, like before 1914, a decisive battle. But this decisive battle did not happen between 1915 and the beginning of 1918. It was uh, sought, many battles were fought, but none of them was really decisive. So on this uh, slide you will see some vocabulary in English to uh, describe the uh, organization and uh, the environment of uh, a trench. The reason why decisive battles were not uh, possible anymore was that the weaponry had changed. Modern weapons were now much more powerful than before and the ability of the industry to produce as much ammunition as necessary uh, changed everything. So here with this picture I, I want to deal with artillery, that is to say cannons shooting shells. Here you can see a very big cannon uh, which was probably able to fire a shell uh, that would be dropped a couple of kilometers away. And the artillery was really the weapon that caused most of the damages uh, during this war. Damages on the bodies, because 80% of the wounds were caused by artillery. And one body out of five was never found after the war. But artillery also destroyed the land. Here you can see uh, on this picture a different form of artillery, not big cannons, but on the contrary, very short, uh, short range cannons that were uh, aiming to, to shoot a shell just on the other side of the trench. It was uh, on the French side and the nickname given to this little cannon was Le Crapouillot. If you look at the picture carefully, you can see uh, not only the organization of a French trench here on the side of a little hill, but also how destroyed was the landscape. And indeed, seen from above, this is what it looked like. Uh, a moon-like landscape where uh, the, the plain the field is totally destroyed by the thousands of shells that have been dropped. And so, very famously, this area, extremely dangerous, almost a landscape of hell, this area between the two trenches was uh, nicknamed No Man's Land, a term that was even used by the French soldiers. So both sides organized a system of trench networks in order to protect themselves and organize their defense. And in fact, the problem for the soldiers of World War I was that defensive weapons uh, overtook offensive weapons. Probably alongside the artillery, the weapon which made all the difference and, the, the difference and changed warfare forever was the machine gun which was a British invention that we already evoked uh, in the lesson about colonialism. And the ability of um, machine guns to shoot an incredibly high number of uh, bullets in a minute uh, made uh, the breakthrough almost impossible. On this picture, you can also see that the British soldiers are wearing gas masks which are really terrifying, and we know that soldiers hated them. But gas, uh, poisoning gas, uh, that uh, was able uh, to um, uh, 
to make you become blind, for example. Uh, some uh, type of gases uh, could even destroy the skin. Uh, were extremely scary, if not very murderous. And then, anyway, uh, these few pictures are here to show you how warfare changed completely uh, during World War I. On this picture, you can see as well uh, the uh, uh, a scheme showing the organization of a British trench in France. And so, if you look carefully uh, on this slide, you will see uh, some uh, key vocabulary that can be used to describe that kind of uh, organization. So as I said, uh, no battle proved to be decisive. But as you can see on this uh, French map, many battles happened between 1914 and 1918. None of them making a real difference because the front line barely moved. Uh, more than uh, a few kilometers uh, for three years. But the number of dead and the number of casualties, which also include w includes wounded soldiers, uh, was astonishingly high. Uh, see that during the Battle of Verdun, uh, 700,000 people died and the battle lasted from almost one year. Uh, as a, a matter of comparison, uh, the Battle of Azincourt in the Middle Ages, one of the famous French defeats, lasted one afternoon. The Battle of Waterloo, only three days. The Battle of Verdun lasted almost a year. The meaning of a battle had completely changed as well. And so the cost of the strategy chosen by the generals in this modern warfare was extremely high. Good example of that is the Battle of the Somme, uh, which was fought for a couple of months in the second part of the year 1916. And uh, The country where the Battle of the Somme is the most uh, important in memory is Britain, because the Battle of the Somme was really the great battle of the British army. Uh, on the other side, the Battle of Verdun is remembered as the great battle of the French army. And in fact, the two battles are linked because the reason why the Battle of the Somme was, uh, um, was fought uh, was uh, connected to Verdun. Uh, since February 1916, uh, the French were struggling to defend their front line against German offensives in the Battle of Verdun. Consequently, the French troops were less numerous than planned uh, for the Battle of the Somme, by the way, and so the role of the British was increased. But the Battle of the Somme aimed to compare the Germans to fight not only one but two battles on the Western Front Line. And it was one of the biggest and bloodiest battles in world history, fought by three million men, causing one million dead and even more wounded people. The strategy chosen by the British, uh, in accordance with the French, uh, was uh, that for seven days before the 1st of July, the Allied had bombed the German lines in order to destroy the German artillery. Millions of shells were shoot, shot, sorry. And consequently, on the 1st of July, a massive offensive, offensive was launched. Thousands of soldiers were sent over the top, which means out of the trenches. But they were surprised because, in fact, the German trenches had been barely destroyed. They were made of concrete and uh, their machine guns had been dug so deep in the ground that they had been almost uh, unaffected by the Allies' bombings. And so the British on that day were slaughtered by machine guns. The German defense system was extremely well organized. And so the battle turned into a long war of attrition, whose goal was to lead the other army to collapse by inflicting continuous losses in men and materials. The Allies indeed had more resources and troops than the Germans, so they knew they could uh, find a take a strategy like this. 
they also kept on trying to break through the German line, but eventually, at the end of the battle, their advance was only seven miles uh, when the offensive was called off in November. So this battle of the Somme shows all the characteristics of the modern trench warfare. The massive use of artillery, notably the, tactin or the tactic known as creeping barrage, when artillery is fired just in front of the advancing army to ease, to ease its passage. The growing use of aircrafts uh, for the first time, and also the first experiment of tanks. For the British, the social impact of the Battle of the Somme was really, really huge. It was the first offensive for thousands of young British volunteers who had been recruited in 1914 and had trained for two years. But as the recruiting strategy of the, Briti in, of the British implied the making of what they called pass battalions, that is to say, battalions were men that knew each other, that were friends, pals. Uh, they were organized in order to encourage men to enlist. You see, if your friend, your best friend was uh, uh, volunteering, uh, you knew you would fight on his side. And so it encouraged people to, to, to join the army. But on the 1st of July and the following days, entire villages uh, lost almost all of their young men because some units that went over the top during the Battle of the Somme uh, were totally destroyed. And so the losses were not uh, evenly distributed in Britain. So some villages uh, were tragically um, affected by this violence. The German forces in the end were seriously damaged by this battle of attrition. But they also reacted by later changing their tactics and accepting to retreat in order to defend themselves more effectively. So, the situation was uh, totally um, um, blocked on the Western Front. And so, quite logically, uh, the government decided to find new front lines and this led to a globalization of the war, which is how what was in the beginning a European war quickly became the first world war. On this map you can see some of the battlefields that uh, were the theaters of uh, the first world war. Uh, basically there are two reasons why the, uh, the first world war went global. The first one was that the European powers that were fighting were also colonial empires and so the war was very quickly exported uh, in their colonies and so mostly in Africa. The other reason is that uh, after a couple of years the United States decided to join the war. So as I said uh, the colonies of European countries were involved in the war. Uh, colonial troops were extremely uh, numerous due to um, uh, the, the domination that European powers had in their colonies. And so uh, opening new front lines around German colonies in Africa and the Middle East was a strategy chosen by the French and the British. Uh, with success, in fact, because most of the battles that were fought in Africa uh, led to German defeats in the end. And among the things that Germany lost in World War I, uh, we can note that Germany lost all of its colonies. Um, the Allies were so mostly successful outside of Europe, except in the Ottoman Empire, that is to say, uh, around Turkey. So, uh, this is another map where you can see how um, Turkey became uh, um, a very important battlefront uh, during the year 1914, uh, sorry, 1915. And here something must be specifically said about uh, what is called the Gallipoli campaign. Uh, 
or also the Dardanelle campaign. It depends on the, the landform that is referred to when you speak about this battle. But in fact, we are speaking about a very strategic place on the map of Southern Europe. Uh, the straits that connect the Mediterranean Sea to the Black Sea. Uh, and so you have this peninsula of Gallipoli and the Strait of the Dardanelles that you can see on the map. So in the context of the stalemate on the Western European Front, the powers of the Entente, so the Allied, they try to take control of the Strait of the Dardanelles. They had two main goals, to weaken the Ottoman Empire that was allied to Germany and to take Constantinople and provide a supply maritime route to Russia via the Strait and the Black Sea. So it was a very strategic spot. From February to April 1915, the Allied focused on trying to take control of the Dardanelles Strait, but failed. Many British battleships were notably sunk by the Turkish artillery. Then from April to January 1916, they landed on the peninsula of Gallipoli, but never achieved to conquer more than a few meters. Thousands died and the soldiers had to hold on under constant Turkish fire, living among the corpses with big problems of sanitation and notably of water supply, uh, which was really one of the key um, logistical aspect of this battle and you can see on this picture here some um, British forces whose role is not to fight but to uh, provide the soldiers with enough drinkable water. One thing which is interesting about the Gallipoli campaign is uh, who fought it. In fact it was mostly fought by non-European soldiers. On the side of the Allies, uh, many soldiers from the British Dominions, and in particular from Australia and New Zealand, uh, participated in this uh, battle. In fact, this participation was so important that uh, the Gallipoli campaign is almost considered a national day nowadays in Australia and New Zealand. You can see here are some of the ANZAC troops, so for Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, and here a poster calling for recruitment in this British Dominion called Australia. The reason why uh, it is so important for Australia and New Zealand is that it was one of the first acts that Australia and New Zealand did in international relations after uh, they, are, uh, they receive their autonomy from Britain. But in fact, even on the French side, uh, most of the soldiers that uh, were sent to Gallipoli were colonial soldiers. But contrary to the Australians, the Senegalese tirailleurs, the tirailleurs Senegalais, of the French army, and also the soldiers from North Africa, which were nicknamed les Zouaves, uh, were not uh, volunteers. In the context of colonial domination, they were recruited by force, uh, even though they were paid, very badly paid actually. And the fact that they were sent on this extremely murderous battlefield, where uh, human losses were certain to be extremely high, is something that is uh, really shocking nowadays. Uh, it is very likely that uh, uh, Senegalese soldiers were chosen by the generals, maybe because they knew that they were sent to immediate death. And indeed, the Gallipoli campaign proved to be a very costly defeat for the Allies. Even though casualties were numerous on both sides, approximately 250,000 each, but it was seen as poorly prepared, as a real mistake because the landing was the first landing of modern warfare and the British had really underestimated the difficulty of facing modern artillery. It was Winston Churchill that was in the charge of the Royal Navy, uh, first Lord of the Admiralty, and he was sacked after this disaster.
the Battle of Gallipoli was also important for the Ottoman Empire, for Turkey, because it was a moment of national pride after decades of decline for this state, and uh, it would later be celebrated by the new Republic of Turkey like a great moment of its history. Overall, on this map you can see how huge was the involvement of colonies uh, regarding men and regarding losses as well. You can notably see how important was the uh, mobilization of the soldiers in the British Empire and in particular soldiers from India which did not only fight in the colonies but also fought like many African soldiers for France on the trenches of Flanders and northeastern France. And this mobilization of colonial troops uh, was met with some resistance, both in the British and the French Empire. It was less massive than the national mobilization, but nevertheless important, notably, as I said, in the British Empire. Some figures. In France, 8.3 million nationals, so French national soldiers, uh, fought the war, and half a million colonials. And in Britain, the share was 6.7 million nationals and 2.7 million colonials, half of them from India. One last aspect of this globalization of the conflict was the fact that the war was also fought in the sea. Naval battles were not new, but what was new was the fact that warfare was now submarine. And this was largely due to a new weapon uh, created by the Germans, which was the military submarine. This submarine warfare was mostly fought in the North Atlantic. And the reason for that was that um, the Allied had uh, organized a blockade, a naval blockade of Germany in order to prevent Germany from trading with the rest of the world and so cause problems of supplies for uh, Germany and its allies in Central Europe. And so as you can see on this graph the number of attacks and often successful attacks by uh, submar German submarines on uh, uh, allied uh, ships, including uh, civilian ships sometimes, uh, was really growing. From the, the year 1917 the German submarine warfare became unrestricted submarine warfare. In French, guerre sous-marine à outrance. Uh, it meant that uh, the Germans did not bother to observe if the ships they were destroying was civilian or military. A couple of years before, the sinking of the Lusitania, an ocean liner, uh, crossing the Atlantic from Europe to uh, the USA, or maybe the contrary, I don't know, which had been sunk by the Germans, had been considered a war crime, largely referred to in the Allies' propaganda in order to recruit more men, as you can see on these two propaganda posters. Uh, submarine warfare uh, is a good illustration of how war became... Uh, total, that is to say that all aspects of uh, everyday life were involved by the war, were affected by the war, and it also illustrates how much economic supply was really a key aspect of this war. And now how World War I came to an end. In fact, it came to an end just after a period of crisis in the war effort. And as this crisis in the war effort did not only happen in one country, I chose the, pur the plural form, war effort crisis. Well, the war at sea that I have just described, the submarine warfare, accelerated the US involvement in the war. In April 1917, the USA officially joined the Entente. And thus they were putting an end to a long tradition for the USA of what we call isolationist foreign policy. 
which meant that the USA were traditionally neutral regarding international relations in Europe. The president who made that decision president was President Wilson. He did that uh, he made that choice even though he had promised to stay out of the war. But the USA were sending more and more weapons to the Allies and eventually 2 million US troops fought on European soil in 1918. So you can see some of them on this picture of US soldiers landing in the French port of Saint-Nazaire near Nantes. And I have also chosen to show you this very famous a uh, recruiting poster showing Uncle Sam, the allegory of the US government, uh, calling the uh, American men to enlist uh, in the army. So this picture, very different, uh, shows the tragedy of French soldiers uh, who uh, uh, went on uh, rebellion against their officers in the year 1917. That's a, a famous illustration of the crisis in the war effort. In the French army they took the shape of mutiny, that is to say that some soldiers refused to obey orders because they rejected um, maybe not the war entirely even though some of them did, because they thought that this war was fought uh, for rich people and governments, but only poor, normal, common people were dying. But in fact, it was more uh, exactly a rebellion against the strategy that was chosen by the generals. This strategy of breaking through, which was so murderous. And so, uh, a couple of thousands of French soldiers uh, became uh, mutinies. They either deserted or, or uh, officially refused to fight and uh, for the example some of them uh, were condemned to the death penalty by military tribunals and executed like you can see on this picture. That was certainly a crisis. But it was nothing compared to the crisis that Russia was facing. In Russia the situation was totally chaotic. Uh, soldiers uh, were not supplied in food or clothes or ammunition, and uh, conditions uh, on the domestic front, I mean conditions in the cities and countryside, was also terrible with cases of famine and huge economic problem. And so it resulted in a double revolution. The first one took place in March 1917. In fact, it is known as the February Revolution, but this is because the Russian calendar did not correspond to the European calendar. So anyway, it happened in March. And the first revolution was a kind of popular revolution, including farmers, workers, and also soldiers. And it led to the abdication of the Tsar, Nicholas II, who was made a prisoner. So Russia became a republic. But because this republic uh, tried to uh, keep on fighting World War I and uh, sustain the war effort, which was rather impossible, many strikes and uprisings of workers and soldiers took place. Uh, many revolutionary committees called the Soviets were creating, created all over the country. And eventually, in November, the Soviets made a second revolution and the political group that organized that second revolution was a political group of the far left led by Lenin and uh, largely organized by Trotsky two extremely famous historical characters of the 20th century they were communists they believed in the ideas of Karl Marx and they took power by a coup d'etat in November 1917 and made some major decisions. They decided to ban private property and totally reorganized the economy and the society in Russia. And about the war, they decided to put an end to war for Russia and sign the separate peace treaty 
with the Germans, which was in a way the treason of uh, France and Britain. But for Lenin and Trotsky, uh, this war was not uh, the choice of uh, their government, not the choice of the people, and so it should not be fought. So this could have uh, given an advantage to Germany, because Germany did not have to fight the Russians anymore. And it was, in fact, it was high time for Germany to try something, because, as you now know, uh, the, the, the balance of power uh, had really changed. Uh, the Allies were too powerful now that the USA was also on the side of France and Britain. So what the Germans tried uh, was in March 1918, uh, they, they believed that their last remaining chance to win the war uh, before being overwhelmed by the deployment of US troops and materials uh, was to break through. And so uh, they had the objective to break through in the Somme and to force the French to ask for armistice, uh, but um, uh, eventually they failed. They failed, but this German offensive on March marked the deepest advance in the front line since 1914. And so Germany almost won the war. One of the reasons of the failure of the Germans was the problem of transport supply. Um, the, the Germans had also conquered land of limited value. Uh, they um, had mostly conquered, destroyed no man's land while the Allies had protected the most important areas, like the ports on the English Channel and some important cities. A couple of months later, what happened in Russia also happened in Germany, in the capital city Berlin. There was a revolution. Uh, largely due to the economic problems and all the social problems that had resulted from the war effort. And on the 9th of November, the German Empire was overtaken and a republic was proclaimed. Two days after, it was the signature of the armistice. The armistice, signed on the 11th of November, marked the end of the military events of World War I. Uh, it was signed because the counter-offensive of uh, the French, British and the Americans, you had two million fresh US troops, uh, was being successful. The front line had been pushed back to Belgium and so the new German government, the Republican government, decided to sign the armistice and start negotiating with the Allies. So the war was over on the battlefield, but it was not yet over regarding diplomacy. So most of the soldiers kept their uniform, they did not fight, but now it was time for diplomacy and negotiation.